Good afternoon. Uh, we're going to get started because I, I know that uh, most, if not all of you, have a commitment that you need to leave slightly before one, so that's uh, uh, understandable. I want to welcome you to the Humanity Series. Um, this is the first series of this academic year. I'm David Brown. I'm the Associate Dean for Health Equity and Inclusion, for those of you who haven't met me. Um, we started the Humanity Series last year because I thought over the past few years there were a lot of challenges to humanities. And um, so how do we kind of respond to this in a proactive way so that we understand some of the issues and we're able to discuss it in an organized and, and civil manner? Our first series was on LGBTQ health, and our second one was on Muslim health. And today we have a, a special guest, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha. Uh, I want to thank the leadership of BMA uh, because they were uh, the group that kind of suggested this topic and the speakers, so I want to give them a round of applause for getting. And it's extra special because I just talked to Dr. Hannah Atisha and she said that uh, that she gets so many requests that she has to, she can't attend them all, but she said Tim contacted her so long ago she had to commit. So thank Tim for getting on top of things early. He's, he, he knows opportunities. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Mona Hannah Atisha. She is uh, the director of the pediatric residency program at Hurley Medical Center, and an assistant professor of pediatrics and human development at Michigan State University's College of Human Medicine. Uh, she's a Michigan native and grew up in Royal Oak and fell in love with pediatrics while on the Flint campus during her clinical years in medical school. After completing her residency and chief residency at the Children's Hospital of Michigan, um, she earned a master's degree in public health, concentrating in health management and policy at the School of Public Health at, at the University of Michigan. Uh, Dr. Hannah Tisha was an assistant professor at Wayne State uh, University's Department of Pediatrics and an associate director of the Children's Hospital of Michigan Pediatric Residency Program prior to returning to Hurley. In addition to educating the next generation of physicians, Dr. Hannah Tisha directs the Michigan State University and Hurley Children's Hospital's Public Health Initiative. And this is an innovative uh, and model public health uh, program to research, monitor, and mitigate the impact of lead in uh, Flint's um, drinking water crisis. So without further ado, Dr. Hannah Tisha. Awesome. It's great to be here. Um, let me kind of just get a sense of who's here. Uh, M1 students? Awesome. M2? M Ooh, M3? M4? They're off doing rotations. Uh, so I'm, oh, yeah, awesome. Where are you? Okay. Uh, faculty? Two faculty? Okay, great. Uh, anybody else I might miss? All right, that's pretty much everyone. Uh, what's that? Staff? Staff? Awesome. Okay. Um, it's great to be here. Um, like I said, I, I, I largely um, don't have time to do a lot of talks, um, but Tim uh, was fantastic. He contacted me super early, really early on in the Flint water crisis before it really exploded. Um, but I also have a, um, a place in my heart in talking to medical students. Uh, so it's really important for me to share this story with you um, because you are our future workforce in healthcare and it's important for you um, to learn about the water crisis and learn um, what role you can play in potential um, public health issues in the future. Um, so my talk is called Physicians as Clinicians, um, Researchers and Advocates. So 10, so what's 10? So 10 parts per billion is the World Health Organization's action level for lead in water. So, you know, I never thought as a pediatrician I'd know so much about water, um, but now I do. Um, so an action level is, is a level where you need to do something. So that's when the World Health Organization says, that's when you need to do something about the possibility of lead in the water. So 15 is the EPA's action level, so the Environmental Protection Agency's action level for lead and water. And really both this 10 and the 15 are arguably too high of action levels because these levels were based before the science has taught us that there's no safe level of lead in a child. And then just a few months ago in Flint, um, we had a home with a lead level of 22,905. Think about that. 
22,905 parts per billion of lead in water. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult to even comprehend um, this number. Um, and, and, you know, how could we even have gotten here in a city that's in the middle of the Great Lakes in 2016? So the way to think about it is like, is like drinking through a lead-painted straw. Um, and these are our friends at the EPA. Um, this is how they describe it. So our pipes are like straws. And they are so severely corroded um, that ships scale from those pipes are coming off to this day, this is our third year, are coming off of those pipes um, into our drinking water. So our children going on, this is our third year, have been drinking um, through these lead painted straws. And I want you to meet one of our kids. So this is, this is me as a clinician. So this is me and my regular job is a pediatrician. So I see kids at our Hurley Children's Clinic, which sees the most Flint kids um, in, in the county. So this is Carrington. Isn't she adorable? So she just came in for her two-year checkup. So who wants to go into pediatrics? Yeah, awesome. Best profession, best specialty ever. So hopefully you all change into peds. Um, so, so she just came in for her two-year checkup. And I look in her ears, and I told her I saw Elmo, and her eyes, like, totally lit up. Um, I looked in her eyes. I examined her belly, and she totally giggles. Um, and then she takes my stethoscope, and she tries to listen to her knees. Um, so she is um, an awesome, perfect two-year-old. Um, and then her mom turns to me, and this is kind of an all-too-familiar um, thing that's happening in Flint these days. And she turns to me after her checkup, which was pretty much fine, and she turns to me and she asks me, is she going to be okay? Is Carrington, a two-year-old, um, going to be okay? So for her entire life, she had been drinking through one of those lead-painted straws. For her entire life, think about that. Um, do I tell her mom um, about the epigenetics of lead? We now know that lead um, impacts future generations. Uh, mothers exposed to lead, you can see the DNA changes in their grandchildren. Do I tell her that the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, says there's no safe level of lead? Do I tell her that it impacts a child's cognition and behavior, it actually drops IQs, um, leads to behavioral problems like attention deficit disorders, impulse disorder. Lead exposure has actually been linked to criminality. Do I tell her that every state and federal agency that was supposed to protect her daughter failed? Instant. Do I tell her that we just had a home with a lead level of 22,905 parts per billion. So as a clinician, what do I tell her mom? And we'll get back to that. So how did we even get at this number? So who's from Flint? Anybody from Flint? Nobody's from Flint. Anybody from Genesee County? Anybody been to Flint? All right, awesome. Uh, so um, Flint? is literally, so Michigan, you guys have been in Michigan enough now, this is what we do for Michigan, right? So Flint is you know, pretty much right smack dab in the middle of the Great Lakes. And the Great Lakes are actually the largest source of fresh water in the world, in the world. Um, and what is Flint famous for, guys, before the water crisis? Cars, right, cars. So Flint is the birthplace of General Motors. Um, GM was born in Flint. Um, and we essentially put the world on wheels, and that started in Flint. Um, and GM's birth created the unions, um, really, in the United States. The UAW in the 1930s, 1940s had a sit-down strike for 44 days in the Michigan winter. They sat in one of the Mich in GM um, plants um, demanding living wages and demanding benefits, and that created the birth of the UAW. And that really created the birth of the middle class. The middle class was born in Flint. There's a subdivision in Flint called Civic Park, and it's celebrating its 100th anniversary. And it was the first subdivision in America. Um, at one point, Flint had the highest per capita income. So you moved to Flint for great, great living wage jobs. 
we had the best public health indices. Um, and really, people from the great migration north to immigrants abroad came to Flint for great jobs, great infrastructure, great schools. And then what happened to Flint? Anybody know? Collapse of the American auto industry. Great. So we lost those jobs. Um, we lost those great union living wage jobs. At one point, GM employed over 80,000 people in Flint. Now it's less than 5,000. Um, so with, um, with the job loss came disinvestment, came unemployment, came poverty, came violence. Uh, we have one of the highest crime rates in the nation. The military special ops medics, so like the Army Rangers, Navy SEALs, each team has a medic. Those medics actually train in Flint because it's an essentially a, a war zone on our streets. We have no full service grocery stores. Um, crumbling schools, almost every disparity you think of, we have. We have a 40% poverty rate. In the state of Michigan, it's about a 16% rate. For our kids, it's about a 60% poverty rate in Flint. People who live in Flint have about a 15 year less life expectancy than a neighborhood suburb. So very much your place um, really impacts your entire life course trajectory. So this kind of financial collapse of, um, of Flint led to an almost bankruptcy state. And in 2011, Flint lost democracy. So we were under state-appointed emergency management, and the goal was save money, save money, save money, save money, do whatever you need to do to save money. Um, and it was decided that the water that we had been getting from Detroit which was fresh, pre-treated Great Lakes water was too expensive. And a, a way to save money was just to start drawing water from the local Flint River. It's a great idea. We don't have to pay for it. It's right there. Let's just draw water from the local Flint River, and then we don't have to pay for the expensive pre-treated water. And it, it didn't seem right. Um, so right away, people complained. Um, it looked like this. This is real. It looked gross. Um, it tasted gross. It smelled gross. We had um, boil advisories because of high levels of E. coli in the water. We had three boil advisories. Then they dumped a lot of chlorine in the water to take care of all the bacteria. And then for nine months, we had safe drinking water violations because we had so much disinfectant byproducts by a byproduct of chlorine uh, known as TTHMs, total trihalomethanes. It's a carcinogen. And then in October of 2014, um, General Motors, which is still in Flint, stopped using this water because it was corroding engine parts. So a year before, you know, my research, a year before it really went crazy, GM stopped using this water because it was corroding their engine parts. So think about that. Um, that's when really red alarm bells and sirens should have gone off in people's heads. Um, if it's corroding engine parts, what's it doing to our plumbing, um, which is predominantly lead-based? Um, so for 18 months, um, the people of Flint were heroic, and they raised their voices. And they went to town hall meetings holding jugs of brown water, and they would get arrested. And nobody listened to their voices because their democracy was gone. There was no democracy in Flint. And when the emergency manager recently testified in Congress, they asked him, did you, talk, did you listen to the people of Flint? He's like, no, I didn't have to because he wasn't an elected official. Um, so this was a poor, low-income, low predominantly minority community that was not being listened to. And for 18 months, they were trying to get their voice heard. So it turned out that the Flint water, the Flint River water, was 19 times more corrosive than the water that we had been getting from Detroit. And it was so corrosive for several reasons. Um, lake, river water is innately more corrosive than lake water. Who knew that you'd learn all this like as a physician? Um, but um, it was missing an important medicine. It was a missing an important ingredient to treatment. Every water treatment is supposed to have something called corrosion control. Um, it's like a medicine that you put in the water that seals the pipes um, so the pipes don't corrode. And the flint treatment was missing that corrosion control, and it, it was necessary. It was necessary part of every water treatment has it. So this more corrosive water that wasn't being treated was going into an aging infrastructure. So most of our plumbing um, in the Midwest 
um, in the Northeast has a lot of lead service lines. These are the pipes that go from your water main to your home. And a lot of the premise plumbing, which is your household plumbing, is made of lead. Our nation was very stubbornly slow to remove lead from plumbing. It wasn't until 2014 that we restricted lead from many brass fixtures, fixtures in, in different faucets. Um, and not until really 1986 that it was restricted from a lot of the service lines. So we, we, we know we have lead in plumbing really everywhere. Um, so this corrosive water wasn't being treated, was going into an aging infrastructure. And there was one more reason that it was a perfect storm for lead to be in the water. Um, people weren't using their water as much. Um, because of the almost bankruptcy state, Flint was paying the highest water rates in the nation. So imagine that for 18 months, two years, they were paying the highest water rates in the nation for water that they should not have been drinking. Um, and because of that huge economic decline in Flint, we'd lost a lot of people. So 2014 was the first time that our population dipped under 100,000 people, and that created um, a lot of stasis in our water distribution center um, in system. So our water infrastructure was built for a population twice its size, and, and we'd lost that. So that created more time for lead to come out of the pipes and into the water. So that created a perfect, perfect storm for lead to be in the water. And an amazing researcher from Virginia Tech, his name is Mark Edwards, he's an environmental engineer. Um, he was contacted by a mom who Googled like lead and water, and she found that he was like the foremost expert um, in lead and water and corrosion control. And when he found out that Flint wasn't using corrosion control, he packed his minivan overnight with graduate students um, and with supplies, and he drove from Blacksburg, Virginia, which is really is in the middle of nowhere. Anybody from Blacksburg, Virginia? No offense. Uh, it's a really nice city. Um, he drove from Blacksburg, Virginia to Flint um, to prove that the people of Flint were right. Um, and he did something called citizen science. So he empowered the people of Flint to test their water, and he collected all of their samples, um, and he tested it in their lab free of charge. He used his own money, and he put them all up, all the results transparently up on a website called flintwaterstudy.org. You can check it out if you want. Uh, and he was hoping that, hey, um, if I can prove that there's lead in the water, then maybe you know the policymakers would listen, and maybe you know we could get this water treated, and you know the people could be heard. But um, that didn't work. So um, the state of Michigan officials actually called him a magician. That wherever he goes, he just pulls rabbits out of hats. That's a direct quote, that he pulls rabbits out of hats. So just like the people of Flint were dismissed, and the moms, and the pastors, and the journalists, um, so was this environmental engineer, who is a MacArthur genius. He's an absolute genius. Um, and he was also dismissed. So um, I randomly um, heard from a girlfriend who just uh, was over my house. Uh, she's a high school girlfriend um, who happens to be a water expert. Um, she was over, and we were having a glass of wine, because all good stories start with a glass of wine. Um, and she's like, Mona, you know, you're up, you work in Flint, and have you heard about the water problem? I'm like, well, yeah, you know, this bacteria and there's all these things, but the state says everything's okay, so we're telling our patients everything's okay. She's like, well, you know, I, I heard from a friend that there's no corrosion control, and if there's no corrosion control, there's probably going to be lead in the water. And lead? Um, that was the very first time that I heard the word lead. Um, and when a pediatrician um, or anybody with any public health background hears the word, word lead, um, it's really a call to action. Um, lead uh, exposure is known as an environmental injustice. Uh, many people go so far as to call it environmental racism because it already disproportionately impacts our most vulnerable children. So kids in Flint, kids in Detroit, kids in Chicago and D.C. and Baltimore, they already have higher rates of lead exposure um, because of lack of control over where they live. So they have household lead exposure from peeled paint and post-industrial sites. And because of poor nutrition, when you have an empty stomach and when you're deficient in certain nutrients, you absorb lead more readily. So our kids already had higher burdens. Um, and we know that it causes this huge impact for a child's entire life course trajectory. So when you hear um, the word lead, you don't sit on it. It's not a nine to five issue. Um, you, you have to figure out what's going on. And that's where my hat changed from a clinician um, to a researcher. Um, and I knew that I couldn't go out and say, I think this is a problem or I feel this is a problem. I knew that if I had data, 
um, I could move mountains. Um, and based kind of in all my past experiences, be it um, negotiating resident work hour changes or building a new clinic or what have you, if you can show data and you can show outcomes, you are more likely to get what you want and make a difference. Um, so right away, um, I tried to get that data. I tried to get children's lead levels. Um, so we are mandated by Medicaid um, to screen children for lead. Medicaid serves as a proxy for poverty. So remember, it's these low-income kids that have higher rates of lead exposure. Um, so we had the data. Um, so I just did the easiest research project I have ever done in my life. And I looked back at the data. And I looked at kids' lead levels before the water switch. And I compared them to kids' lead levels um, after the water switch. Um, and this is what we found. So in the city of Flint, this is the city of Flint. Flint has nine wards. Um, the red area was the area that had the highest um, blood lead levels, the greatest increase in children's lead levels. Um, and it all directly correlated with where the water lead levels were the worst. What we found was that the entire city of Flint, um, the percentage of kids with elevated lead levels doubled. And this is contrary to every trend that had been happening in the nation, in the state, in the city. For the last 30 years, our work in lead has been a public health success story. We got lead out of paint, we got lead out of gasoline, we have all these home mitigation efforts. So every year that percentage of kids with elevated lead levels has been coming down and down and down. Decades ago, we were walking around with much higher lead levels, but we have learned a lot from science. Um, so even in the city of Flint, we'd had the, um, the percentages for, for years and it had been coming down and down and down. And this was the first time that it went up. And then, in, so, so this, this is Ward 5, which is in the center of the city. And these numbers here are the water lead levels based on the work from Dr. Edwards in Virginia. And in this ward, 32% of the samples tested exceeded that EPA action level of 15 parts per billion. So this ward had the highest water lead levels. And it was in that ward specifically that the kids' lead levels, um, the kids with elevated lead levels actually tripled. It went from about 5% of kids tested with elevated lead levels to about 16% of kids in this ward had the highest lead levels. And this research was all an underestimation of the exposure um, because we don't screen kids um, for, for lead when they're most at risk for water lead. We screen kids at the ages of one and two because that's when they're at risk for household lead. That's when kids are crawling and developmentally they have a lot of hand to mouth activity. So they're at risk for lead paint and lead dust and lead in, in your environment. But water lead infects and impacts an entirely different and more developmentally vulnerable age. It crosses in utero. Um, and it impacts those babies on formula. So as a pediatrician, we always recommend a tap water that you, you can mix your powdered formula with tap water. So these babies, for the first year of life, had been getting this tap water mixed with powdered formula. And these numbers don't capture that because the half-life of lead is only about 28 days. So a child's peak lead levels could have been at two months or three months or four months or five months, um, and it's not captured by this. So this is an underestimation of exposure, and that is why the state and the federal government, everybody's saying everybody who drank or cooked with this water was exposed. So we did this research, and then, um, and then this is where I, my hat again changed. So I had my clinician hat, and then I had my researcher hat, and this is where my hat changed to an advocate hat. So you guys, who's been involved in a research project? here or in the past, awesome. You guys probably have more publications than I do. So, um, so what, do you guys, what do you guys do? How do you share your research? I just said it. You publish, right? So how long does that peer review process take? A while, right? So it takes months and months and months, right? So we couldn't wait months and months and months. We had to share our research as soon as possible. And that is where your role as a physician um, is needed. You need to be an advocate in your community. If your community um, has lost their voice, like very much what has happened in Flint, you need to use your voice. Physicians have incredibly credible and powerful roles in our community. And you all, why did you guys all go into medicine? You wanted to help people, right? You want to make people better. You want to make communities better. And there is not a profession that is more credible than the physicians to be that voice in their community 
um, for better. So, you know, research shows as you progress through medical school, as you progress through residency, as you progress, become an attending, you get jaded. You lose that focus of why you went into medical school. Um, and you get consumed with ICD-10 and EMR and billing and revenue and blah, 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 seeing 100 patients a day. So you, you have to remember that um, you have this incredibly credible voice and, and to never lose sight of why you went into medical school, um, especially um, when you are practicing in vulnerable communities. So we shared our research at a press conference. So um, it was about a year ago today, um, end of September. Uh, we needed to tell our families and our community um, what we found, that we had concerns with this water um, and that people needed to take precautions. Uh, babies needed, needed to use bottled water, not use this for filters. People needed, people needed to have filters and, um, and then eventually we needed to switch back to, to Detroit water because this water was not safe. Um, and I felt great after that press conference. I'm like, yay, we're protecting people. I got picked up by, you know, local media. That's awesome. Um, and I felt great for about an hour um, because just like the people of Flint were being dismissed and the moms and the pastors and the journalists and, and Mark Edwards and his team, um, right away I was dismissed as well. Um, so the kind of the media machine from the state um, said that I was causing near hysteria, uh, that I was an unfortunate researcher, um, that I was splicing and dicing numbers. It was awesome. Um, so the entire, the entire state with maybe 50 epidemiologists um, said I was wrong. Um, and it's hard not to second guess yourself, you know, because uh, people are like, well, how big was your team of researchers? I'm like, actually, it was just me and another young mom who did all this research. Um, they're like, who funded you? I'm like, nobody. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, and this research, this research was done in, in, in two weeks, but it was like six months of research because me and my co-researcher, we just, we didn't, we hardly slept. We had a, you know, coffee only diet. Like we needed to figure out what's going on. Uh, we had to find out if this, our, you know, if our kids were drinking this water. Um, so, um, so there was this backlash, like you're wrong, you're wrong. And finally, um, after about two weeks, um, the state relooked at their numbers um, and realized that, hey, no, my research is right. Um, and there was a problem and that's kind of when things began to change in Flint. Um, and then by mid-October, we did switch back to Detroit Water. So about three weeks after our press conference, we were back on Detroit Water. Um, but to this day, our water is not safe because the 18 months that we had um, this severely corrosive water damaged our infrastructure so much, like you saw earlier, um, that our water is still not safe. And obviously, we became a federal emergency and all this stuff happening. But right when we, and I, didn't, I didn't care about the attacks. I didn't care about anything. And people are like, well, I have people apologize. I'm like, I don't care about the apologies. Um, my focus um, as a pediatrician are my kids. Um, so right when we knew that there was something in the water that they had been consuming for 18 months unchecked, um, that they were consuming something that could threaten their tomorrows, really, our focus really shifted on how to protect and preserve the tomorrows of our kids. And then that's how I spend my every day. Um, so right now I direct um, this initiative. It's called the Pediatric Public Health Initiative. Um, and it is our effort to flip the story. It is our effort um, to do whatever we can to preserve the development of our children. We can't take this away. Lead is an irreversible neurotoxin. Once it's in your blood, it's in your blood. There's nothing that you can do. But you can do a lot to mitigate it and to promote children's development. Um, there's a whole field of adverse childhood ex experiences. Anybody familiar with ACEs? Awesome, some folks. ACEs and toxic stress. So lead is an added ACE. It's an added toxic stress that our children already had so much adversity, like I mentioned before, and this was an added adversity. So taking the concept of ACEs and toxic stress, we know how to buffer children, um, and this is how you buffer kids. You take this wrap around public health approach. Um, so many days, I'm speaking to the Chamber of Commerce on the importance of jobs because lifting our families out of poverty is going to help our kids um, more than the amoxicillin I give them for, you know, a, an, an infection. 
Um, so we are trying to build resilience in our kids um, through all of these wraparound services um, in the fields of education, uh, especially early education. Our focus really is prenatal to preschool. Uh, we've learned so much from developmental neurobiology. We've learned about brain plasticity. We've learned that we can buffer the impacts of adversity, especially in that first five years of life. Um, so things that have happened. Um, so now this fall, we actually have universal preschool for all our four-year-olds. We have a new zero to five center um, that's opened up um, in Flint, quality childcare um, and quality preschool. We have expansion of Head Start, which is preschool. We used to have one school nurse in Flint, one school nurse for the entire um, school district. Uh, now we have 10 and we're opening up three, three school-based health centers. Um, we have expansion of nutrition access. Uh, we give out nutrition prescriptions in our clinic right now. Uh, we have a mobile market that launched last week, so it's a mobile grocery store where you can use your food assistance dollars and double up food bucks dollars. We got expansion of Medicaid, so we've about 15,000 more people, uh, kids in Flint now have Medicaid, which is the necessary health and behavioral health services they need. But it's not just regular Medicaid; it's called target has something called targeted case management which is home visiting programs um, that can k get people connected to resources. Um, we have a huge expansion in, in home visiting programs from early on um, to all kinds of different things. Um, so we, um, we're doing awesome, awesome things because there's a, many of us in Flint that do not want to be defined by this crisis, but rather um, our hope is to be defined by what we do after this crisis. We're also robustly assessing and evaluating our work because if we can turn things around in Flint, we can really turn things around in many struggling communities um, that have either a lead issue or have poverty issues or have other um, things threatening their children's uh, future. So a lot of these um, efforts are happening uh, here. This is my clinic. Uh, so this is the Hurley Children's Clinic. Um, it's affiliated with Michigan State University. It's where our pediatric residency program is. Our clinic is actually on the second floor of a farmer's market. Uh, it's really cool. So it's the only clinic um, in the country that we know is co-located to the farmer's market. And that was done very purposefully because, like I said, we have no full-service grocery stores in Flint. So why not move our clinic to a grocery store? Um, and then every kid that comes in our clinic, they get a prescription. And it prints just like your prescription for an antibiotic um, for fruits and veggies. Um, and they can go downstairs, and that's a $10 gift card for them to buy fruits and veggies. We also have an integrated um, dietitian in clinic. We have cooking demo classes um, downstairs. We have an integrated um, a social worker. Um, we have behavioral health services in clinic. Uh, the WIC office, uh, WIC, which is uh, uh, for pregnant uh, moms and women, uh, children up to the age of five, it gives them the nutrition assistance, um, is now located in our clinic. And most, one of the most important reasons we are where we are is because we're also directly across the street from the central bus stop. Um, so transportation is by far our patient's largest barrier to care. Every day in our clinic, about 20 to 30% of our patients do not show. Um, and it is not because they do not love their children just like everybody else loves their children. It's because they have every barrier in the world to get what they need. Um, so this clinic is an example of really embracing social determinants of health. What we do in medicine contributes only about 10 to 15% of health outcomes. It's all that other stuff that makes communities and children especially healthy. Um, so the American Academy of Pediatrics, now they've mandated a new screening. So not only do we have to do developmental screening and hearing and vision and blood pressure, we are now mandated to do poverty screening. Um, because it's those kinds of indicators, um, and if, if you can make a dent in those indicators, you can really improve um, your patient's health outcomes. So our clinic is awesome, so anybody's welcome to come visit anytime. Um, and I want to share, and so hanging in my clinic um, is a gift that I just got from a, from a toddler classroom in Flint. Um, so there's t um, a child care classroom full of toddlers. So these are two-year-olds. Um, and the teacher's like, we want to come by. The toddlers made something that we want to give to you. I'm like, okay. I'm like, what is it? She's like, a water bottle chandelier. I'm like, okay, that's really interesting. I'm like, what's that going to be that two-year-olds make made? So we have tons of water bottles, obviously, in Flint, because like I said, the water's not safe yet. 
And these kids made this absolutely gorgeous chandelier. And it's taller than me, which doesn't say much, but it's like at least six feet tall. Um, and when they were making this, they were learning colors, and they were following directions, and they were using their gross motor and fine motor skills, and they were getting absolutely messy. They're like being perfect toddlers. Um, and they created something absolutely beautiful. So this hangs in our clinic. And when it sways and hits the light, you can see all these gorgeous colors. Um, and every time I walk into clinic and I see this, I smile. Um, and everybody who sees this smile. And it is a constant, constant reminder of our ability to turn something that was so tragic um, into something so beautiful. Um, so it is, um, it's definitely a theme of our work um, that we are hoping to turn kind of this, this preventable disaster um, into an opportunity uh, to improve our children's um, health outcomes. So you may in the future remember Flint um, as the city that built cars, uh, the birthplace of cars. Or you may uh, remember us as the city that contaminated its water supply that needed the National Guard, the actual National Guard, to come in um, to deliver safe water. Or you may remember Flint uh, with a lead level in a home of 22,905 parts per billion. Um, but what I hope that you remember is our kids um, our kids like Carrington, our beautiful, smart, strong, resilient Flint kids, um, and how physicians who served, wore many hats, um, hats as clinicians, uh, hats as researchers, and hats as advocates uh, to really identify and improve um, the health outcomes of an entire community. And then I want you to remember that you all don't have to get in your car and come to Flint to make a difference. Um, there are disparities absolutely everywhere. Um, and to be cognizant of these disparities, to be cognizant of the role of social determinants of health um, in your daily practice, um, because you guys are going to go out um, and you guys are so blessed to have this education. Um, and the world needs you. The world needs you in Flint, but the world needs you everywhere um, because there's many issues all over the place. You just have to keep your eyes open. Thank you. more than happy to take any questions about absolutely anything. Hi. Um, thanks for speaking to us today. I was wondering, so you talked about a lot of really cool public health initiatives within your own clinic um, through expansion of Medicaid, it sounded like, and other like education initiatives. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where the, I'm sure there were many different sources, but where the funding came fr hmm. from for mm -hmm. those different uh, sure. initiatives? Uh, so the question was about funding of a lot of the awesome stuff we're doing. Um, so it's a combination, a blend of different things. So the state of Michigan passed three supplementals for Flint, which totaled about $200 million. Um, a lot of that was the water, the filters, um, kind of the, the immediate uh, recovery work, um, but some of it went to the nutrition, the education, and the healthcare stuff. The Medicaid expansion came from federal government. Uh, philanthropy foundations have played an incredible role in Flint. Um, the Mott Foundation uh, is actually based in Flint. That's our hometown funder, um, and they've played a significant role. Uh, do you guys know how much Congress in D.C. has given to Flint? Zero, zero, zero. How much have they given to Zika? Zero. So our Congress is kind of incompetent right now. Anyways, uh, so <laughs> take home message is vote, vote. Okay. So um, so we have gotten nothing um, from from Congress. Um, in addition, this was a man-made disaster. So we were a federal emergency. We were not a federal disaster. It was a delineation. So that did not free up additional federal resources. So we have funding to do a lot of this great work for maybe one or two years. For example, uh, the early on expansion is state funded for two years. A lot of the school health programs are state funded for one year. Head Start expansion from the state gave us one year of funding. This is work that needs to happen for decades, if not generations, and we have yet to garner those long-term resources that we are hoping may come one day if, if Congress decides to do what they need to do. So it's a blend of funding. I, I, I want to just, first of all, thank you for your incredible work in Flint, and uh, thank you for coming here and sharing your wisdom and your, your experience with our students. Um, 
as you talked about the three roles, I would like to um, respectfully add a fourth role that you play and ask you to comment on it, and that is uh, a role as physician, as educator. Um, you are a residency program director yeah, as well <laughs> uh, for the pediatrics residency training, and I'm, I'm sure those residents are Neglected. just uh, yeah. <laughs> great to work with. Um, but one of the questions we're starting to ask and trying to ask in a very deliberate fashion is what is the role of an education program in helping to train the future advocates in addition to the future clinicians and researchers, which we've always done well, but the future advocates as physicians. So Absolutely. could you comment a little bit about that, both as it relates to medical student education yeah. and graduate medical education? Yeah, um, my real hat, which was not there, is I'm a residency director. So my main job is to train pediatric residents. Um, and I came back to Flint um, to, to merge the disciplines of, of pediatrics and public health in the role of medical education. I wanted to train pediatricians who had uh, knowledge of public health and advocacy and what have you. Um, and when you do anything in education, the impact is multiplicative. It is great for me to go out there and advocate and talk to whomever, but it is so much more important for me to train the next generation of advocates. Um, it is very specialty dependent. For example, pediatrics, um, it is in your job description. You have to be an advocate. Uh, we have a rotations in community pediatrics. This is what we do. The American Academy of Pediatrics, our professional organization, espouses this. We have advocacy conferences. My residents, even before this, we go to Lansing, the state capitol, every year and advocate on gun control or immunizations or what have you. So it is very specialty specific. Um, but more and more specialties are recognizing the importance of this. For example, family practice, a little bit of internal medicine. Um, but you have to want to do this. So you're not going to go into, um, you know, if that's not what you want to do, you don't have to do that. But it's, it's also not generalist versus specialist. For example, when um, my residents are in our pediatric critical care unit and there's a kid there with a head injury, we talk about helmets and we talk about policies. And if we have a kid with you know, abuse and neglect, we talk about those things. If we have a child in the neonatal ICU, we talk about infant mortality and disparities. So it spans every discipline. I think learners, you guys, are also mandating and driving our curriculum to have more of an advocacy focus. Um, you as millennials want this stuff. This is why you want, got into this stuff. So you also see, um, you see that happening in medical school curriculum. So there's more and more medical schools that are merging public health programming, public health coursework, public health tracks where you can get additional either a certificate or what have you in public health. So it, it, there used to be silos of medicine and public health. They cannot be silos. Um, like I said, if you want to make that impact in your patients, you need to merge those silos together. So the question was about, I'll repeat it, the question um, was about my MPH. So um, after my residency, uh, I came back here to U of M and I did my um, MPH in health management and policy at the School of Public Health. Um, and um, a lot of people who are, say, in academia will also have an MPH or that's a passion. And many of you have also kind of passions in, in public health. And it's hard to figure out when to do that public health degree. Um, you can extend medical school. You can have it be part of residency. You could do it after. Um, so it, it's, it's very personal dependent. Um, for me, I think it played an incredible role. So um, all of the emails during the Flint investigation have now been released through FOIA, Freedom of Information Act. And there's actually an email that came out from um, the state um, in the Department of Health and Human Services say, be careful, this doctor has a public health background. She understands epidemiology. So it's awesome. Like, <laughs> I was a threat. It was great. Uh, so I think it definitely added credibility, um, you know, uh, to, to, the, to the science, the advocacy. Um, and I always knew that kind of public health. I, I went into pediatrics because of my love for public health. Everything we do in pediatrics is prevention, immunizations, car seats, back to sleep, um, you know, the, the advocacy role. Everything is, is, is very much prevention. So, um, so f you know, and now there's more flexibility. Lots of residencies and lots of medical schools will, will enable you to do that. I think here at U of M it's a, an added one year and you can get your MPH as a medical student. 
Thank you so much for coming to speak to us today. Um, one of the most troubling things about this story is the sort of disenfranchisement of the people on the ground, their loss of their voice. Um, are you aware of anything that's been done to prevent that from happening? Because in my head, if the people on the ground are heard, this doesn't persist for 18 months. Absolutely. So this was a clear disregard for democracy, for people's voices, and really heroic voices. Um, so there's been a lot of efforts to build civic engagement and community capacity. Um, the Ford Foundation specifically and some other funders are specifically um, funding community-based efforts to make sure that their voices are articulated and this does not happen again. Um, there's also been an incredible new movement uh, in the community. There's a new organization that was created called Flint Rising, um, which is like there's a lot of new younger people um, to you know get their voices heard. And a lot of these folks um, started out as advocates against the emergency management law. So they were part of some like this democracy defense league and all the other folks. And um, lots of people in Flint are working together now that never used to work together. So sometimes it takes a crisis for really communities to come together, really diverse pieces of the community, um, and new voices in the community to come together and, and to be articulated. So um, all of our work ongoing has community participation. Um, even if you know we're developing this registry right now of you know identified kids and tracking, and it's really complicated. But we have parent partners. Like, what do parents want us to look for in our kids? Um, MSU's entire public health programming is in Flint, and it's all based on community-based participatory research. Everything happens with community. We even have a child advisory group. We have kids advising us on what to do, because they're the smartest people. So. Other folks? In the early days of the crisis, um, when kind of you were really one of the first people to really realize what was going on, what was the reaction in your professional and academic community to kind of this yeah. new knowledge? So the reaction in, in my professional and academic community. So um, I was very well supported. So even before I started this research, I, I asked my CEO, I'm like, hey, I'm going to look at this water issue. And we are, we are a public hospital. There's only 2% of hospitals left that are public. We're city chartered. We're state funded. It was a mayoral election time. One of the mayoral candidates was on our board. It was politically messy. And she's like, Mona, you have to do this. We're a children's hospital. We're a public hospital. Go for it. So she always had my back. Um, the Genesee County Medical Society, well, they were one of the first people I went to. Um, and they supported me as well. And as the, the kind of, um, I'm on the board of the Michigan chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and they supported me. But the support came because they knew me. So I had this built credibility. I was a trusted person in the community. I was this residency director. I had done research. Um, so it, it, it it came because of the power of network. Um, so what what enabled the state to finally relook at their numbers was because of a conversation I had with the state medical director. We had done a, um, a press conference together a few months prior. I was there representing um, the Michigan AAP. She was representing the state. It was about a press conference about the importance of back-to-school immunizations. And I had met her. And, she, and then she's like, and then so after this water crisis started and after they were um, dismissing me, she called me. She's like, Mona, do you remember me? I met you at this press conference. Um, you know, tell me how you did your research so we can you know, do the same thing. Um, so it speaks to the power of network and to meeting people um, and to, to, to really getting out there. Um, and also speaks to being prepared. So you're not going to wake up one day and say, oh, today I'm going to save the world. No, it doesn't happen that way. So it takes kind of years of deliberate practice. Um, so it, when I have, you know, I, it, when I talk to media now, it's not the first time I talk to media. So like, you know, you'll be asked in your training, like, does anybody want to speak about the, the rotavirus outbreak or, you know, about Zika on TV? And you're all, many of you will be like, no, I don't want to, uh, no, this, I have somebody else do it. But like, do it, you know, because you never know where you're going to need those skills in the future. Um, it wasn't the first time I spoke to a legislator and lobbied for things. Like I said, advocacy is part of our curriculum in pediatrics. And I had worked with them, you know, before and realized they're just regular people just like you and I. Um, um, so be prepared because you never know when you're going to need to use these other skills. Um, a funny story, uh, lots of folks have come in and out of Flint, lots of celebrities. Um, Chelsea Clinton came a few months ago, um, and she's got like a, a degree in public health, and she sat down with me for an hour, asked some really amazing questions. And then she left, and then um, uh, some media guys, like, can I do an interview? I'm like, okay. So we go to an exam room in the clinic. She came to clinic. And he asked me about like the current water situation and funding and Snyder and this and that. And then I had my white coat and my stethoscope on. And then the, the, the TV guy stops 
and he looks at the otoscope like hanging on the wall and then he looks at the exam table and then he looks at my white coat my stethoscope and he's like you're not doing what a doctor is supposed to be doing and I'm like I shot back I'm like this is exactly what a doctor is supposed to be doing um, this is my job as an advocate and this is you know to, to influence public policy to improve the outcomes of my community um, so this is your job as much as you don't think it's your job it's your job um, you know who knew I would know about parts per billion of lead so you get you know these things also just kind of just fall in your lap and you get thrust in them but if you are prepared um, you know you'll be able to run with it Thanks so much for coming. What do you see as um, possibilities going forward for improving or fixing the um, crumbling water infrastructures that are all across the country? Yeah, so there's been many silver linings of Flint. Um, and I think one of the silver linings or recognitions nationally is that uh, Flint is not unique in terms of our crumbling infrastructure. Uh, there's lead and water issues really throughout uh, that we've learned about recently. Um, we think our roads and our bridges are bad, but probably what's underneath is even, is even worse. Um, and there's lead in all of, of plumbing. Do you guys know what the word plumbing means? What's the elemental symbol for lead? PB, plumbum. So le lead means plumbing. It's the Latin for plumbing. Uh, so um, we are hoping um, for national improvements in infrastructure. There's currently a bill uh, in U.S. Congress that's called water, WARDA, the Water Resource, and it has, it was just released actually this morning, um, and it has funding nationally for water infrastructure. Uh, we've also been trying to push for more national funding of lead prevention programs, um, public health programs in general, uh, you know, early education programs. So there's been a lot of hopeful new investment for these things. But once again, Congress doesn't so much. <laughs> Anything else? Go ahead. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, so my question is kind of general. It's more of like a what's next question. And in specific, like, um, what do you think like um, medical students and other health professionals should do to either help Flint or um, help other communities that might be suffering from lead in their water? Sure. I think um, I think the most important for you right to, what what you need to do right now is is to be a medical student. Um, you need to have that degree so you can go out and do this work. Um, so I have a lot of my residents are now like signed up for a bazillion, a bazillion things and they want to do all these projects and grants. I'm like, stop. You need if you don't graduate, you can't practice in the future. Um, so it's really important for you to be an excellent physician. Um, to 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 live and breathe medicine right now um, so that you can graduate and do these things. But if you have any free time, um, <laughs> you know, and want to do anything, you know, we'll gladly take people who you know, for research programs or different things. Um, but I think just, you know, enlighten yourself, read the New York Times, read the paper, know what's going, go to community events, if, you know, meet people. So just, you know, broaden your horizon as much as possible. Try to get as much public health training, environmental health training, advocacy training, uh, volunteer for things. You have amazing, amazing opportunities in this campus um, to do great work. So you don't have to come to Flint. Like I said, there's opportunities to do awesomeness really right here. But don't stay here. Go out, you know. Go, go. Flint and many places like Flint need you, need your brains. I have a quick question. Um, First, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. You're truly an inspiration. Um, I was just wondering, initially, um, when there were so many unknowns, and then even now, when there are unknowns for these children, how did you comfort them and their families in, in those moments? And right. So you find, as a physician, a lot of what you do is reassurance. We're really good at reassurance. It's just a virus, supportive care, TLC. Um, so now I am doing a lot of that same reassurance and, and almost like say we're writing prescriptions for hope. Um, so we're empowering families to do what they can um, to, to empower their children. We're also doing a lot of um, positive messaging community-wide. We have this huge uh, campaign that's going to start on Flint kids are strong kids, they're smart kids, they're resilient kids, they're healthy kids. Because we have kids who watch TV and they hear brain damage. So we're definitely trying to counter that. So I tell parents, like Carrington's mom, um, that she's going to be fine. Love her, read to her, talk to her, sing to her, turn off the TV, give her great nutrition put her in preschool come visit me we do developmental screens um, and you know and you know
know, and we'll follow these kids. But we are very much, and it's very much kind of my message is, is of hope um, and trying to instill hope in a community that's very, very traumatized. What we see right now is, is trauma, like a PTSD because of kind of anxiety and betrayal and a lot of guilt from our families. Thank you, guys.